in July of 2023, compliance officers from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in its Marlton, New Jersey area office went down to Millville, New Jersey, and conducted an inspection at a steel fabricator plant in Millville, New Jersey, called Kenrick Steel. And they issued a number of citations pursuant to that inspection. Kenrick Steel issued a notice of contest and contested those citations, and then filed suit in U.S. court challenging the constitutionality of the process and arguing that the constitutionality issues resulted in an inability to secure a fair trial, essentially. We're going to talk about Kenrick Steele's arguments uh, in favor of its theory the, that the process lacked constitutionality on a number of grounds in this November 2024 episode of the OSHA 3030. Hello, everyone. I'm Manish Rath. Welcome to the OSHA 3030. I am an attorney at the law firm Keller and Heckman in Washington, D.C., and for almost 30 years have been engaged in representing strictly management side in the field of occupational safety and health law, amongst other areas of law. And I'm fortunate today because I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Taylor Johnson. Taylor, welcome to the OSHA 3030. Manish, thanks for having me. Pleasure as always. It's my pleasure. Taylor is a valued uh, MVP on our team on the OSHA side as well. Taylor engages in uh, representing corporations in the fields of uh, various aspects of environmental law as well as transportation law and a number of other areas. And uh, I think your insight on this case is going to be extremely helpful to the members of the OSHA 3030 community. So thank you for, for being a part of today's episode. Yeah. Well, I think we have an important case uh, in the field of uh, OSHA law and what could actually be an important case in the field of broader field of administrative law generally, Taylor. So why don't we start by telling members of the OSHA 3030 community what we're going to talk about over the next 30 minutes. Yeah, sure. So I think where we're going to start is we're we're going to just talk about the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. Uh, a lot of times on the program, you'll hear us just refer to this as the commission, um, but we'll just give a primer here. So so what exactly is the Review Commission? How is it structured? Because um, it's going to be really important here when we get into this case. Yeah, that's right. And uh, all this flows from a U.S. Supreme Court decision that came out this past year, the Securities and Exchange Commission versus Jarcusy. And this case has the potential to be one of the most important decisions to have been issued by the U.S. Supreme Court this term. Yep. And so we ought to talk a little bit about Jarkesy, the Jarkesy decision first, and then get into this case. Exactly. That's a great idea. Because in this case, Kenrick Steele versus OSHA, uh, Kenrick Steele uses a lot of arguments um, sort of coming from the, the, the Jarkesy decision. And so it's going to be important to know that. So Taylor, why don't we first talk about the facts and the uh, Kenrick Steele case, and then get into the procedural background uh, and and uh, some of the the uh, storyline that led into filing suit. Yeah, and then their arguments, um, Kenrick's arguments, and then sort of where we are now. You know, um, what's the current posture of the case? What can we look forward to? I think that's a good plan for today, and then we should wrap up as we always do here at the OSHA thirty thirty with practical takeaway items for you in the community. Uh, what employers should do in light of the Kenrick Steele case. So, Taylor, why don't we get into it? Yeah. Okay. So, the commission, um, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. Um, so, just a few just grounding you know facts here. So, this is an independent federal agency, Monish. And the way I think about it is sort of you know two tiers. Um, so, at the first tier, you have your administrative law judges or your ALJs, and then on top of those um, is the appellate level. If you want to think about it, like you know in the criminal context or, or civil context, so the trial stage is really the ALJs. The appellate or the review stage um, is this panel of three commissioners called the commission. Yeah, and it's important to understand, folks, that the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission is an independent agency. It does not exist under any major department, like, for example, the Department of Labor. So Congress in 1970 enacted the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And it that act created three distinct agencies, NIOSH, OSHA, which sits in the Department of Labor, and then the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. Last month here on the OSHA 3030, we were fortunate enough to be able to go down to the U.S. Department of Labor and meet with the head of OSHA, 
uh, the title for which is the Assistant Secretary of Labor for the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Honorable Doug Parker, uh, joined us as a guest on our show. If any of you did not catch last month's episode, you should go back and catch that on our website. All of our prior episodes are housed on our website, khlaw.com slash OSHA3030, and uh, including that last month's episode where we had a really great conversation with the Honorable Doug Parker, the head of OSHA. Now, that is a an agency under the Department of Labor, and the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission is an independent agency. It does not sit under any department, and it is the it serves as the tribunal for matters that are under contest between OSHA and any party which it issues citations against. So, so OSHA will issue a citation, and if an employer contest that citation, then OSHA will hand the matter off to its own internal office of the solicitor who will prepare a complaint, and the complaint will be filed before this third-party independent tribunal, this third-party independent agency, the Review Commission, which serves as an independent tribunal, and it will be assigned to an administrative law judge. And as you say, Taylor, the next level above that independent uh, administrative law judge under the Review Commission would be to be handed up to the review commission itself. This right. is a three-person commission, uh, all of whom are political appointees, and uh, they they serve as the commission, the three commissioners. And we've had, uh, on a number of occasions, commissioners from the review commission come on our show as well. Uh, so please look for those uh, prior episodes of the OSHA 3030 where Previous commissioners from the Review Commission have have uh, had conversations with us. Yeah, uh, interesting, interesting episodes. I still, I think, still very, very relevant. So now, that is uh, the in a nutshell, a painting of the structure of the Review Commission yep. as it stands today. These three commissioners, I should point out, who are appointed political appointees, could theoretically be removed by the President of the United States, uh, but only on the basis of an articulation of inefficiency or of negligence or of malfeasance. The administrative law judges, however, are very different. They are a part of the civil service and they can be removed only by the commissioners upon showing of good cause and given an appoint, uh, an opportunity to be heard uh, before removal, before the Merit Systems Protection Board, the, the uh, Merit Systems Protection Board being the same board that would hear removals uh, for any civil service uh, employee. So the MSPB gives a right to notice and hearing mm. for those ALJs the same way they would for any civil servant. Okay, that's that's the review commission. I think that's a, a pretty good understanding, the, yeah. the kind of which we could accomplish in a minute or two. Yep. That gives us a grounding, for, as you say, for, for the rest of our program. Right, right. So let's now talk about the SEC versus Jarkasi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you said, um, you know, could very well go down as being one of the most important Supreme Court decisions, um, certainly in the last year. Sure. Um, so so the basic facts. Um, so this is an SEC case. Uh, there was an investment advisor who was cited for for fraud, essentially. George Jarkasi. Exactly. Under the Securities Act. Um, so SEC brings claims uh, through, you know, their their administrative proceedings, um, which involve an ALJ. So so there's your nexus to, to OSHA law. That's right. So so. George Jarkasi was uh, alleged by the SEC to have engaged in uh, fraud, uh, fraudulent activity, well-known person in the investor community. He contested, and this is important, Right. he contested those allegations, denied those allegations. And as you're saying, Taylor, the SEC has its own core of administrative law judges right. that when it issues citations, their matters are brought before. Big difference? Their administrative law judge system is all housed within the SEC. Right. When the Occupational Safety and Health Administration brings claims against employers, it its office of the solicitor has to bring a charge to this independent agency, the review, the Occupational Safety and Health right. Review Commission. Whereas with the SEC, I think this is a big difference. Certainly, these are yeah. all entirely within the agency. So George Jarkissi's arguments were that you, SEC are both the analog of the police officer issuing a, a citation or a ticket, ticket yep. as well as the judge. The judge. 
yeah. and you're serving as all of those in one agency. Right. Right. Yeah. That's exactly what his argument was. Um, essentially that, you know, these, these three branches, you know, you're, you're doing, you're, you're combining the the powers essentially. Of the executive and the judiciary. And, and the judiciary. Yep. Um, and so the court hears these arguments and actually rules uh, for, for jarcusy. Um, so the opinion is that, you know, when when the SEC seeks civil penalties against a defendant, that the Seventh Amendment actually entitles a, the defendant to a jury trial. Um, it, a key distinguishing fact here, um, and one that I think when we get to the Kenra case that they're going to have to really combat, is that one of the reasons why, in fact, I would argue the main reason why the, the court ruled how it did in this case is because they said that the violation here, fraud, was grounded in common law. And because of that, that that, that Jarkazi was entitled to a jury trial under the Seventh Amendment. I think that OSHA will certainly argue and Kenrick will have to battle when we get to this case, not to jump ahead, but that that, you know, OSHA laws are not as grounded in common law as as, you know, fraud, essentially. Yeah, it's hard not to jump ahead because we're essentially talking about the U.S. Supreme Court case, SEC versus Jarkissi, that will be cited by Kenrick Steele when it sues OSHA, which it did yes. uh, this past couple of months ago. So, so this is an important sort of uh, uh, ground zero for all of the arguments that are going to take place going forward in this as, as the yes. Kenrick Steele case evolves. Yes, uh, which it has not yet done. So, yeah, I think that's an important point you're making, Taylor. That that Jarkissi is arguing a few things that don't appear here. Uh, one of them that I talked about was that the SEC has its own in-house uh, administrative law judge right. core. Right. And the other is your point, which is, I think is a fair point that he's, he's saying, if I want to get a fair trial, I deserve a trial by jury. And because this is a civil claim, this deserves the protections of the seventh amendment of the constitution. Yes. To, to give you guys some background on the divide between the sixth amendment and the seventh amendment, the sixth amendment pertains to criminal accusations and the seventh to civil cases uh, against a party. And the Seventh Amendment protects in civil cases uh, uh, defendants' rights to, to a jury trial. Yep. Yep. Okay, I agree. That's an important point. And as to whether or not that applies in Kenrick Steele, I think that's an open question. I'm not here to give an no, answer. Certainly not. Just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I think it's, it's the open question. It's yeah. Uh, so, so Kenrick Steele, we can, we can do a little bit of grounding here. Um, so they're a New Jersey based steel fabricator. Um, there's a citation launched in July of 2023 for, you know, I, OSHA essentially threw the book at them here. Uh, you know, respiratory protection has, has calm gantry cranes, you name, I think 11 total citations or violations, excuse me. Right. And a lot of the evidence they gathered during the inspection were based on observations by the compliance officer. And th those formed the uh, evidence that they believed supported allegations of violations. And but they also found that that Kenrick Steele had engaged a third party consultant in the field of occupational safety and health. And they found documentation that that this consultant had raised some of these same issues. And so that for that reason, OSHA raised elevated the classification of its alleged violations from serious in some cases to willful yep. bringing the penalty total to uh, $350,000 across 11 citations. Uh, these 11 alleged violations, each maybe having subparts, some of them, uh, the, some of them were serious classifications and some of them were alleged as willful. And the willful ones were based on this premise mm -hmm. that this consultant had already pointed these out to Kenrick Steele, and Kenrick Steele should, according to OSHA, have taken action sooner. Kenrick Steele, of course, says that these alleged violations are false on their face, and uh, they they deny that these were, they qualify as violations of any of these cited standards. Yep. And that's also important to point out. Because Kenrick Steele takes the view that these alleged violations were incorrect statements of uh, an alleged violation, they believed like George Jarkissi, that they should have an opportunity for a fair trial. And included in that concept of a fair, what I, I describe very generally as a right to a fair trial, Jarkissi, uh, I'm sorry, Kenrick Steele alleges uh, involves at least three components. One is that if they're going to go before an administrative law judge, that 
that judge should have the same uh, opportunity for appointment and removal as a Article Three judge. Right. Right. Two, that the review commission itself, the commissioners should, if they're going to be serving as a tribunal or an appellate level of an administrative appellate level of, of the administrative law judge, that there should be removal powers afforded to the executive over a judiciary uh, role play uh, that the commissioner would play. And then the third would be the jury trial. Right. And then third is that this shouldn't even be before the review commission to begin with. Um, the... Unless it includes uh, uh, access to a jury. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So maybe to state the obvious, it's important to point out to members of the OSHA 3030 community that both in the SEC administrative law judge context that we found with George Sharkesy and the review commission cite, uh, reviewing the citations brought to it by OSHA, there was not a mechanism for a jury trial. Right. These are decided by an administrative law judge, either on the papers or after an administrative hearing. And administrative hearings do not have a mechanism for a jury trial. Those hearings are heard before the administrative law judge. Right. Yeah, and it's it's a jury trial, and then it's everything that comes with it too, right? I mean, you you see Jarkesy and Kenrick sort of arguing that um, not only is it it's, it's you know being a jury of a jury of your peers, but also things like discovery, uh, you know, asking for for inspector interview notes, um, unredacted, you know, things like that that they want the full package. Yeah, just the presentation of evidence and the quality of the evidence and being able to challenge the quality of the evidence. Yeah, uh, is something that I think Kenrick didn't raise, but I think. Uh, is to me included in it. And that's why yes. I, I expand it to a more general concept of a right to a fair, fair trial. trial. Yeah. So, so Kenrick uh, contested the citations issued against it. And then when in their contest, they raised these constitutional complaints, the administrative law judge whom we know well and have been for and have had conversations with many, many times over the years, is well-respected. He saw those constitutional arguments and he asked Kenrick Steele, would you please brief these constitutional arguments that you're raising in your, in your, uh, either your notice of contest or your, your answer to the complaint filed by the Office of the Solicitor. At that point, when asked to brief the issue, Kenrick Steele filed suit before the federal court and sought federal court protection from having to uh, handle its case in the administrative context. And uh, at the moment it filed suit, the parties, which included OSHA, the Review Commission, as well as uh, Kenrick Steele and the administrative law judge individually in his official capacity, uh, all agreed that to have the matter stayed administratively pending the outcome of the federal complaint by Kenrick right. Steele. Put on pause, essentially. Yeah. Right. So so there's a stay currently on the OSHA case while these constitutional issues are evaluated by the federal court consequent to Kenrick Steele having filed a federal complaint. Yes. And now that's where we're at. Kenrick Steele has filed his complaint. But OSHA and the Review Commission have not filed a response yet. They're still within time to file the response. Kenrick Steele's arguments before the federal court are essentially threefold. First, I, I want to do this out of order, if you don't mind. First is this idea of removal of powers, both for the ALJ and right. second for the Review Commission itself. Right. The idea that if Kenrick Steele is to have a fair opportunity to defend itself, it should be able to defend itself before a tribunal where there's a division of powers as called for in the Constitution between a legislative, a judiciary, and an executive, right. and that it should not have to try its case before the executive branch. And one of the elements of uh, evidence of, of the lack of separation of powers here is that the, uh, Kenrick argues, is that the administrative law judge cannot be removed except through this Mayor Systems Protection Board right. uh, process and that the review commissioner's second argument is that the review commissioners cannot be removed except for 
by the president under allegations of inefficiency or malfeasance, et cetera. Right, right. I think Kenrick would like it if the president then would have the ability to remove the ALJs directly as opposed to needing to rely on the commissioners to do that. Right. Yeah. And that the commissioners themselves should be removable in the same way that Article Three judges would be. Yes. This is interesting. Uh, I don't know that they have a argument that has the same degree of certainty here that that would result in a different outcome. Their point is it's sufficient that we're not getting that opportunity before that tribunal and that that's what the framers of the Constitution had envisioned. So it shouldn't matter whether the we can establish that the outcome would be different. We deserve to have our case tried before an Article Three court simply because that's the way the framers had envisioned being able to defend ourselves. Right. But as you say, Taylor, that's how the uh, framers of the Constitution had envisioned defending yourself against civil complaints. Yes. Whether this is a civil complaint or not remains to be seen. Yeah. We know that the Supreme Court believed it to be so for claims of fraud raised by the SEC, but that mm-hmm. does not necessarily equate to these specific OSHA standards of face piece respirators. Right. Inspection of cranes, right? The grounding and bonding yeah, of not, uh, chemical tanks. Yeah, yeah. Your average citizen isn't getting hauled in to court for uh, you know violating Hazwap or by a uh, private citizen. Exactly. Right. Yeah. These are these are creatures of regulatory law that exist entirely within oh, sure. the OSHA Act yeah. and the standards that were promulgated through rulemaking by the agency. Yeah. Okay, so big difference. But yeah. whether that difference is material or not is up for the we'll see. Article 3 courts. Yeah, we'll see. Sorry. I think it's a hurdle, but we'll see. So now let's go back to their other argument, which I actually find quite interesting. And that's the idea that if we want to defend ourselves against these charges, we ought to be able to do so uh, with the right to have a jury as a trier of fact. Right. Uh, they're essentially saying that civil penalties in themselves are legal claims to which you you should receive, you should have the ability to contest them in front of a jury of your peers. Right. And I think they may be also arguing that civil penalties are the definitional feature of a civil claim and thus what puts us under the Seventh Amendment. Right. And that you, how do we know whether this is strictly an administrative charge or a civil claim against us? that would afford us rights under the Seventh Amendment? Uh, well, we, Kenrick argues you should look to the fact that there will be civil penalties. And they they spend a considerable amount of time in their complaint arguing that these penalties are not designed to redress a wrong. The monies paid in penalties in OSHA citations don't go to any wronged party. They go into the coffers of the federal government and they are established. There's a lot of features about how penalty amounts are established that point to the idea that these are punitive in nature. And that because they're punitive in nature, uh, for example, the quantum is based on the degree of culpability. There's mitigating factors for good faith, for example, that these all point to the idea that these are punitive in nature. And thus, Kenrick argues, we should be afforded protection under the Seventh Amendment. Then there's this case that came down in 1977, seven years after the promulgation of the act that has essentially gone unchallenged for the following, what, 43 years. Yeah. And that's Atlas Roofing. Right. And I think, you know, Kenrick tries to come up with some examples of how the Atlas Roofing, you know, decision has been chipped away over the years. But essentially it got right to this question is upheld the constitutionality of the review commission uh, to hear to hear OSHA claims, to hear claims grounded in OSHA law. And that's, again, going to be another hurdle here. For, right. For so Atlas right. Roofing, 43 years ago, raised a similar contest yes. as to whether or not the review commission process was constitutionally fair. Yep. And the the ruling in Atlas Roofing was that, that the review commission system was fair because this was strictly an administrative procedure. The review commission was an independent agency, not, not the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Right. And uh, so... So Kenrick Steele says, well, we understand that Atlas Roofing, the decision came down in favor of upholding the review commission process. But we think we think that the that the Jarkissi case with the SEC yeah. with that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court has now essentially overturned Atlas Roofing. It didn't actually overturn Atlas Roofing because the review, OSHA system was not a contest here. It was the SEC and not OSHA. So, so, but we think that the effect of SEC versus Jarkissi 
was such that it calls into question the uh, bona fides, the relevance, the the enforceability of the Atlas Roofing decision as a precedent. It's it's vitality as a precedent, and we think that this is the case that the Kenrick Steel case, Kenrick Steel argued, is the case where the court has an opportunity to apply the SC, the Supreme Court decision in SEC versus Jarcusy to the Review Commission. Now, again, for the first time in 43 years. Well, that's interesting. And I think that they, they've they basically asked the federal courts to opine as to whether or not the SEC versus Jarkissi was intended to cover OSHA and the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission yep. or not, or whether the differences between the two systems is material. Yep. And whether or not, as you say, the fact that George Sharksy was charged with civil fraud, whereas or, or statutory fraud, but the point is that fraud exists also in the civil context. Exactly. Whereas these do not have civil analogs and they're entirely creatures of regulatory law yep. uh, here in the OSHA system. And then th the third, I think, big difference is whether or not uh, the the fact of independence is material here. Yep. I, I think that those are all going to be things that the court will have to decide and and as well, whether or not Atlas Roofing, whether the Supreme Court ever intended to cover anything more than just this one case or also intended to cover all administrative procedures right. before administrative law judges, as as Kenrick Steele seems to want to argue. If I understand the Kenrick Steele argument uh, correctly, they would have the Supreme Court revisit SEC versus Jarkissi and expand it in a manner that would affect the entire administrative law system. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Or at least, yeah, the administrative law judge system. Right. You'd have jury trials in all of those administrative decisions. Yeah. It seems to me, as I understand the complaint by Kenrick Steele, that only one of two things would satisfy Kenrick Steele. Either all of the administrative law judge programs under the various federal agencies that have them would have to migrate to the judiciary. Mm-hmm. Or you'd have to eliminate those systems altogether, uh, according to Jarkissi, and have OSHA or other administrative agencies bring their cases in federal court. Right. Every time they receive a notice of contest, they'd have to hand it to their office of the solicitor and have suit filed in, in federal court instead of in front of the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. Yeah. So, so I think that that's it's either one of those two that seem to me to be the ultimate uh, argument or relief, maybe I should say, being sought by Jarkissi. Maybe not in the context of this case, but perhaps when you see two uh, or three different splits in the circuit between the circuit reviewing the Kenrick case mm -hmm. and maybe another circuit who disagrees with the Third Circuit. And once you get a, a sufficient number of cases creating a circuit split, maybe then it'll go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. It could take a while. It could. I, I, I would anticipate that it would end up back in the Supreme Court, to be honest, but we'll we'll see. And that's why I want to point out the the, the relief sought argu uh, arguments seem to, to go in a couple of different directions. Yep. And why we discuss what the posture of this case is right now, which is that at this stage, all we have is a complaint filed in U.S. District Court. Uh, in the District of New Jersey, and that it would go to perhaps a court of appeal after that. I'd point out that that the U.S. District Court, being a case a, tr a court of first impression and a uh, trial level court, would be forced to apply precedent as it sees it. Whether that precedent is SEC versus Jarkissi or Atlas Roofing, I'm not opining on. Right. But it doesn't believe of itself to have the power that the appellate court would have. Right. And so that's why I think it would go to an appellate court, the Third Circuit, and then it would go to a number of other uh, courts of appeal under different cases yep. to create a split before I think it would get heard by the Supreme Court. That's a prediction. It's not not uh, actually how things are destined to happen. It could alternatively go straight in this case all the way up to the Supreme Court as well. Yep. That is another possible pathway. Yep. Okay. So – Neither the Review Commission nor OSHA has filed an answer to this complaint. Correct. Uh, that has yet to happen. Deadline very soon. Scheduling order hasn't been set. Right. A stay, hearing, stay tuned. Right. A hearing <laughs> hasn't been set. Right. Probably something that's capable of being heard on the pleadings rather than 
after an exchange of evidentiary uh, yeah you think discovery yeah right yeah well let's spend the next few minutes talking about what we think employers should do in light of this case I think certainly employers who are interested in following this case should stay in touch with us and uh, we'll be following this case and we'll be able to give you an update if you ever reach out uh, and always feel free to reach out in between episodes we we love talking about OSHA law, and if there, if you ever have simple questions of OSHA law that we can answer off the top of our head, we'd love to. We'd love chatting with you about whatever questions are on your mind, uh, and particularly, we'll be following this case as well. Yeah, uh, and then when issued citations, uh, I think we've mentioned this a few times on the program. You know, timely consider uh, which ones should be contested. Yeah, or all of them, but also right. make sure that you uh, a notice of contest is uh, something that has to be drafted very carefully, right. not just to to contest the citation altogether, but you're required to identify those elements that you're not contesting. Exactly. And uh, and whether or not there are other elements of a particular citation like the abatement uh, proposal or uh, abatement date, for example, there's, there's many elements to a citation. Yep. And you have to be very clear about the elements that you're contesting, or maybe you're contesting all of them, right. in which case that should be clarified as well. Um, <clears throat> and then evaluate, I, I think, you know, as we get into this, uh, figuring out what's going to happen in the Kenrick Steele case and this sort of post, you know, Jarkezi world here, evaluating whether a jury trial would lead to a different outcome in your case, I think is going it, to, it's very, it's an interesting thought exercise and it may be something that folks need to do sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think employers, before they know whether or not their rights are being violated to a fair trial, they ought to know whether or not this is a right that they would have an interest in, in asserting or exercising. Uh, likewise, I think that the same can be said for while you're going through the administrative contest before an administrative law judge. Uh, I, I think that at every turn during the discovery process, employers ought to consider which discovery rules to seek relief under, right. which rules of evidence in preparing for trial they wish to seek protection uh, under uh, or have an administrative law judge enforce. Yep. And uh, – and I think that there's two other sort of general concepts uh, under a right to a fair trial that may be at stake here under the under the Kenrick Steele case. Right. You know, the first being just this basic right to sort of face your accuser. Um, you know, you, you obviously you see this in civil and criminal trials um, and see the evidence uh, against you, too, yeah. uh, which in some cases in, in the OSHA ALJ world can sort of be a bit of a black box. So. Yeah, you don't get that right in OSHA contests uh, until yeah. the day of trial. The, maybe not even then. Evidence is is supplied uh, heavily redacted, and OSHA claims that it is protecting employees uh, from the potential for retaliation. But that potentiality, I've always thought, is so specious, uh, and in some cases, completely uh, very close to zero. That that the employer's deprivations should outweigh, and their right to to this concept of facing your accuser should outweigh the uh, interest uh, that may be close to zero risk of uh, retaliation. And and likewise, the idea of a trial by surprise, if you don't get all of your evidence until the trial is actually unfolding, right. or the hearing is actually unfolding, sorry, right. you, you this is trial by surprise, which the federal system works hard to eradicate out of fairness. Yep, yep. So these are the kinds of things that we think employers should do. They should consider these these interests very carefully at every step when an inspection commences all the way through to when uh, they've, they're in the moment of a hearing, uh, defending themselves in, in a contested citation. All right. Well, that's today's OSHA 3030. That is the November 2024 episode of the OSHA 3030. I'm Manish Rath, Taylor Johnson. Thank you very much yes. for joining us. Uh, thank you all to the staff here at Keller and Heckman in our Washington, D.C. office of Keller and Heckman for supporting putting this program to air. And we're really grateful to all of you in the OSHA 3030 community. We've got a couple of important announcements. Again, check out all of our prior episodes, last month's episode with the Honorable Doug Parker, yeah. the head of OSHA. Check out our sister programs that are also stored, prior episodes are also stored on our website, khlaw.com. Our sister programs are the Reach 3030 and the Tosca 3030. Our next episodes will be December 4th at 10 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. Eastern, U.S., respectively. Some excellent topics under the REACH 3030 and TOSCA 3030 by some outstanding faculty, some of our peers here, attorneys at Keller and Heckman. So check those programs out. 
Uh, thank you again, Taylor Johnson, for joining me. Thank you all for participating. We look forward to seeing you again on our next episode of the OSHA 3030, which is scheduled for December 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And also we're going to, going to be rebroadcast as this episode will be as a podcast. So subscribe and don't forget to like uh, when you listen to the podcast so that it's more easily searchable by others. This is the oldest and most widely listened to program as a podcast in the field of OSHA law. And uh, so we, we I encourage you to continue to like the program so it continues to be successful for maybe another 14 years. Thank you all. We look forward to seeing you next month. And until then, stay safe.